was reading the book. It was kind of a little depressing and frustrating because I recognized about three generations of very bad communications. <laughs> oh. Well, that's important for me to for me to pay attention to. Well, I will tell you a little bit about me because I don't know how much you know, if anything. Please help me. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I'm not even sure where to start. Well, I do have a grandmother still. She's 101 and a half. Uh. She lives independently, despite that not being the wisest choice. She is also very adamant, despite her financial situation, which is very excellent, that family should do for her. She's burned out my aunt. My aunt finally, let's see, my dad's been gone for three years almost, two and a half years. Yeah, two and a half years. Um, my dad was his, her oldest son. I, so it's probably been about five years. My aunt basically said, I'm going to do A, B, and C. Psh, that's it. That's it. So my mother is almost 77. She has advanced Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. which is challenging in itself. But the whole parent-child relationship is also a very large challenge. Yep. And the fact that she does not think she has a problem or needs help is a lot of fun because <laughs> she does she does need a lot more help than she would like oh boy so i've been married 30 years my husband is an only child we have one child so the three of us have been pretty good about discussing what i would want if i ended up like my mom because my maternal grandmother and great grandmother also had no memory at the end of their lives mm -hmm. So it's definitely a family history that's not so great. So we have talked about it. And after reading the book, you probably should talk a little bit more. My husband doesn't have a relationship with his parents because despite responsibilities on my side of the family, they think we should just give them money we don't have, deal with, you know, whatever. It's always them, 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 them. Yep. So... He had to finally completely step away from that, which is not an easy thing to do. Yes. <laughs> yep. That's and I, I have one sister. She's four and a half years younger than myself. And we've always seen the world completely differently. So that's always a challenge too. So that's my family in a nutshell. <laughs> Tell me about everything about I need to know about fading memories and who, who was watching us today? Um, my podcast and the YouTube channel are, is for, it's designed for people like myself who are caregivers to a family member with memory loss, either dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever is causing the, the memory loss. That's, that's who I'm trying to talk to. Beautiful. And they're scattered across the U.S. or the world or? The world, predominantly the U.S. Let me think if I can remember the stats. It's U.S., Canada, and I can't remember if it's U.K. and Australia or Australia, U.K. And then there's a whole bunch of handful of non-English speaking countries in there, which I find fascinating since I'm lucky I can speak English well. <laughs> I don't speak anything else well, so... That's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. It's, it's um, a humbling, what's the word? It's, it's a humbling knowledge to have that there's thousands of people listening to what I'm putting out there. Mm -hmm. Well, what a great service. Thank you. When I heard about what you were doing, I wanted to be a part of it. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's um, a very large potential audience. There's over almost 6 million family caregivers in the United States. That's essentially unpaid people like myself. Yeah. But it's hard to find them. They don't just all congregate in one nice, easily targeted group. You think it would be, but it hasn't been. So 
And that six million is for people with memory loss who have family members with a memory loss issue or in general? The six, it's um, 5.6 million people that are taken care of over 16 million people with memory loss. Got it. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And where we are here in California, it's either number three or number two, kind of depending on, I don't know, the day or the month or something. I've never figured out exactly why it flip-flops between two and three. It's a larger killer than breast and prostate cancer combined. Oh, boy. Yep. Oh, boy. Yeah. And it's unfortunately, we're at the very beginning of a tsunami epidemic of this if they don't find a cure a preventative something anything soon it's going to be real ugly it's already ugly yep <laughs> okay well let's jump in sounds like a plan i will introduce you and then um we can talk about the book and all the wonderful insights that you have i really liked chapter eight which was how much is enough, yeah. real responsibilities. I meet way too many people who, they almost end up like martyrs, spread beyond thin and un, unsure, unable, and sometimes unwilling to, to just say, I can't, like my aunt. That's it. That's it. Yep. <laughs> Now, my grandmother's mind is fine, so that makes it easier, but she's mostly blind from glaucoma, so she's needy in a lot of respects and very independent in a lot of respects, so. Great. And when, are, when is this broadcast going to be out? Um, the, well, I, I was told by the, the PR group that your book was coming out the 12th, so that's the day it was planned to come out. So okay. I have another author who's coming out next week because her paperback is releasing next week in the audio book i don't know she we recorded it might have is either i think it was late august okay we planned way ahead on her so <laughs> okay okie dokie so give me half a second of dead air so i know where to start with me today on the podcast is dr ken druck he has a brand new book called Raising an Aging Parent. And I actually did read the entire book over the weekend. It's an excellent book. I personally think it should be required reading for families when their kid hits a very large milestone in, in their adulthood. Either they've moved out, they've got married, they've had a kid. Somewhere, there's not a huge defining line between they're a kid and now they're an adult, but there's there's some big milestones that I think this is a good time to, to read it. And I wish I had read it many, many years ago. So thanks for being with me. Can I call you Dr. Ken? Ken is fine. Okie dokie. Well, thanks for being with me today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So what was the impetus of writing this book? Because when I read the title, Rage, Ra <laughs> easy for me to say, Raising an Aging Parent, Obviously, listeners know that I am responsible, one of the two people responsible for our mom. And that's a handful. So I do feel very much like I'm raising an aging parent. <laughs> you know, Jennifer, we tend to think about raising, you know, when I'm with my friends and their kids, their teenage kids or younger, I always used to joke over the years, I would say, you know, I know it's not easy raising your mom, it's not been easy raising your dad, you know, and I would joke with them, but they always resonated like, God, oh, this guy really understands that it's not just the parents that raise the children. The children are raising the parents, that from the first time they have to help us cope with the fact that they're going to kindergarten um, or they get, they're going away to college or they're getting married or or having their first life crisis, or God knows what else, that they have to deal with the fact that we're making it up as we go, as parents, and that they're going to have to, they're going to end up taking care of us as well. And of course, as our parents get older, um, their care, they're called into caring for their aging parents, and their involvement with their aging parents 
can increase significantly. And of course, if parents are experiencing things like memory loss, they've gotten a bad diagnosis somewhere, they're injured or they're debilitated, um, if for some reason they need the involvement of their adult children or grandchildren, uh, then multiply it by 10. So my thought was, having gone through this with my own mother, um, I was not le lucky enough to really have an aging father. My dad died at 69. And uh, actually my, at my age when I started writing this book, but um, I, I spent many years taking care of my mom uh, right up until the very end. And I thought, you know what? Somebody needs to speak to the experience that our adult children are having. You know, I took care of my mom with all the memories of her as this vibrant brunette and all the old pictures of my mom. And I watched my mom deal with getting older. And I watched my own emotions as she got older, grieving the loss of her younger self, um, watching her become less independent and watching how much she struggled with leaning on me and how, how much she felt like a burden, how guilty, and so on and so forth. And just watching those changes, I thought, you know, somebody needs to speak to those issues in a very direct way. And I thought raising an aging parent, guidelines for families in the second half of life, because that's, this is the psychology of what happens in the second half of life. We tend to think families only in the first half when kids are little, but the second half of life defines our character and the quality of our lives as much, if not more, than the first half. And uh, we need to start paying more attention, especially as you and I have spoken, especially as things change and more and more families are having to deal with memory issues of memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I have a, two quick funny stories about my daughter. She wasn't, I never really planned on having kids, so she was a little bit of a surprise. That's not news to her. And at one point I was like, I don't know anything about raising kids. Oh, what the heck? I've raised tons of puppies. So same predominantly theory. And when she was 14, we got a eight week old golden retriever puppy. And one day she came to me and she said, I always thought that was a joke. I said, no, it's not a joke. <laughs> you raise kids and puppies pretty much the same way. <laughs> she goes, yeah, I've noticed that it's kind of creepy. And then when she started school, she, we, you know, we're walking her into the classroom and she says, you can go now. So. <laughs> that's, that's so, that's so wise. You know, there are parallels. We, we don't want to disempower our children as we're raising them. We don't want them to become, to learn, you know, to, to adopt a condition of learned helplessness because we take over and rescue them. We prevent them from learning how to struggle with and look at their options and do the critical thinking and solve problems. But when they're not capable of doing that, we have to step in and take over. And isn't that the same kind of a situation that we face with aging parents? We don't want to disempower them. We don't want to disrespect them. We don't want to take over where they are still very much alive and capable of making their own decisions or, or help coordinating uh, conversations about what to do. But at the same time, there are moments where we do need to step in and make those executive decisions. And, uh, and our parents may not like that at all. And, uh, and, and then we have to deal with the conflict that most of us would choose to avoid. So how we deal with all that is, is in fact why I wrote Raising an Aging Parent, to begin to help us sort through how do we deal with these situations that arise well it's it, it's like i said it's an excellent book i tried to help my dad while he was still alive he had chronic illnesses so he had his own issues and then dealing with mom whose mind was getting worse and worse and worse which you know for maybe you haven't dealt with somebody with alzheimer's alzheimer's is much more than memory loss. Yes. And I mean, my mom's visual processing is shot and sometimes it's hysterical because she's 
you know, the stripes in the crosswalk just baffle her. The dark parts look like holes. And other times you just want to be like, fling her over your shoulder and get to the car. <laughs> it's very frustrating. But he resisted to the point where I was like, you know, I can't, I can't force him to do these things. And I went through probably, well, probably the last three years. Yeah, about the last three years of his life constantly wrestling with myself on he's not accepting help they need more help how do i help they were 20 miles away so for those people who don't live in california that's about a 35 40 minute trip for me yes. and i was trying to figure out how do i help them when it's just an hour round trip to drive and not significantly chop out a chunk of my life i am I, a decade ago, a little bit, slightly more than a decade ago, went in search of a solution to being significantly overweight. My dad's side of the family, we have a lot of diabetes. I had a client who said, you're overweight, you have a family history of diabetes, you're screwed. That was her exact term. And I, <laughs> this is my personality. I was like, watch me. And I am very, very reluctant to alter my workout schedule for anything, including people who want to pay me money to do my other job. I, I do bend a little more for that, but for other stuff, once you, know, once you start not going to the gym, the next thing you know, now you're only going three days a week instead of six, and then now you're not going at all. And now, while he was on hospice, he was on hospice the first third of a year, first three months of a year. So it was wet and cold and, you know, I wasn't outside riding my bike like I do as much of the year as I can. And I noticed whenever I didn't go to the gym, it was much harder to deal with everything else that was going on. And now, <laughs> if I don't go to the gym Monday morning, dealing with my mother on Monday afternoon, it's not usually very good. <laughs> Well, what you're, you're pointing, you must have enjoyed the chapters on self-care. I, as, as you know and probably read about, I've been giving a program called Professional Grade Self-Care to people who work in high-stress occupations. I've been doing it to military, police department, the DA's office, the oncology departments, hospitals, anybody who works in high-stress occupations. I teach this class and I do a training on professional grade self-care and you've hit the bullseye because it has to be we have to upgrade we can't become caregivers to our aging parents especially those with with the complicated elements of memory loss unless we have a self-care program we've got to balance the two and your commitment to making sure that you are making time for your workouts and, and whether it's walking in nature whether it's a yoga class, whether it's the music we listen to, whether it's uh, an aerobic exercise class or a hike, no matter what it is, or just turning off the noise, uh, mindfulness and meditation, uh, whatever it is, unless we make a commitment to do that, we are draining our cup. We are, we are setting ourselves up for a state of burnout, depletion. Uh, we are going to become the resentful, angry and battled version we're not going to be the best son or daughter no matter how good our intentions are because we're going to be functioning on fumes mm -hmm. one of the things that i've in addition to the workouts now i'm very much a reader i love novels and stuff and i have stacks of alzheimer's books from guests many of which i've read parts of and i have a hard time reading the, uh, many of those books because it's just one more Alzheimer's issue. So when Apple updated all the um, operating software on the phones and everything, now when you're in your iBooks, it, it, you can set your like daily goal for reading, which I, at first I laughed at and I'm like, but you know, I'm always too tired to read. I'm like, so I started with five minutes which is a serious joke for me. Like five minutes is like nothing. And I've upped it to 15 minutes. 
Now, I didn't get any credit in my iBooks for reading yours because I, that was a real book. <laughs> but I've made it a commitment to read a novel as many evenings as, as possible. There you go. Because my mom has declined a lot in the last four months since the beginning of summer. This is the beginning of November, essentially. And she's a lot more challenging. So I need to add even more tools into my, my kit. Exactly. And some of us, you know, in, in the trainings that I do on self-care, I talk about all the self-care saboteurs, all the things we do to talk ourselves out of self-care, to talk ourselves out of that reading, that book, that walk, that hike. And it keeps us on the pain. It keeps us one step behind on the pain curve. You know, it's like the, after surgery, the doctor says, take an aspirin every two hours. You don't want to get behind this pain curve. And it puts us on the opportunity curve where we're staying a step ahead. We're staying in game shape to do what's be, what we're being asked to do and to make sure that our health and well-being, our sanity, our own lives, as we try to live out, you know, it's like, Hey, I have a, don't I have a life too to live here? Or am I going to give all of it away and sacrifice trying to be the good son, the good daughter? Well, the good son, the good daughter, it turns out, takes good care of themselves to the best degree possible. And I know everybody has different challenges and a different situation, but it's up to us to come up with that custom design program for self-care that's doable in our lives, even if it starts with, you know, that five minutes of reading a day or walking two blocks or listening to, instead of listening to breaking news, you know, on the way home on the radio, listening to soft music, something that will calm and soothe our soul, because that's, that's what keep, that's what allows us, you know, there are so many things we can do that are practical, simple, concrete things that every one of us can do, but we have to figure out what's my plan? What's my program? How am I going to take care of myself? And sometimes the best ideas come from our family members asking them saying, well, if, if you could change one thing or advise me of doing one thing differently or more or less of one thing, what would that be to take better care of myself? If that's my plan is to develop a better self-care program, what would you advise me? How would you advise me? And sometimes, it, you know, where the fish is the last to see the ocean. We don't even realize that it's a simple solution that's right in front of us. That's true. I have um, three golden retrievers and I live, I back up to open space. It's, it's permanent. Well, some might, I mean, permanent for me, it's a hundred year open space. So we got about 94 years, 95 years left. I figure it'll be open space the rest of my life. And sometimes when I'm just wanting to rip out my hair and run, like yesterday was a good example. I had, I did audio recordings with my mom. I'm working on an episode on, it was suggested by two gals, two young women from Denmark. It was at a podcasting conference and they said, oh, you should do an episode on the visits with your mom. And I said, well, she's not very conversational. She doesn't actually say very much. That would be a little bit of a challenge. And they, they challenged my thinking on that a little bit. And then I got an idea and I'm working with it. And I get home and I don't know what I did, but I managed to shorten the video, the audio to, and I can't get it back, which usually with an Apple you can. And then I couldn't find the audio recording of a podcast that I did in person. Fortunately, I have the video, so it's not a big problem. But by five o'clock, I was about ready to rip out my hair. And normally, we have our rotary meetings at lunchtime, and then I go see mom. Quarterly, we have an evening one. Last night was our evening one. Mm -hmm. And I was a hair's breadth away from saying, uh uh, I'm not going. I'm being obnoxious. I am crabby. I am not sociable. <laughs> and I went, and I was very glad that I did. And other things that I do is sometimes when it's just like too much, I will go outside and stare at the mountain and just breathe five minutes. Sometimes it's all you need. 
recently learned for those who've been listening, both Ken and I are in California on each end of the state. So we're both experiencing our own fires right now. Yes. Um, I've lived here my whole life. I've never heard them referred to as the Diablos, you know, which doesn't make any sense. It should be devil's breath. And like I said, I don't speak anything other than English. So I don't, I have to look up what breath is in Spanish, but sometimes you have to go out and stand in the uh, gusty wind. Thankfully there's no fires too near me. Hopefully you're, you're in the same position. And then there's other days when it, if I don't want to go outside because it's hot or it's windy or it's cold, I'll just spend five minutes with the dogs. Just pet the dogs, love the dogs. The middle dog is our girl. She makes it easy. You walk down the hall, she's laying there, and she can literally just flip one leg up. That's the only thing she moves. One leg, it's like, oh, okay, pay toll, scratch her belly, then continue on down the hallway. <laughs> and sometimes if I just focus on this dog and this simple need, it kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, it kind of centers me and it's like, okay, I can continue on now. Yeah, I, I, you're, he's laying over there so you can't see or hear Jack, my, uh, my service dog, Boxer, who's a rescue, who rescued us. But it's, it's interesting because I, he, he comes to work with me every day. I, had, I saw clients earlier today and he was with me laying in their laps. Jack is a, is a recent rescue of mine. And for those who are listening who have a pet, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. And he, we adopted him, or he adopted us, after we lost our other dog. And uh, our other dog, Bean, was, was a loving, beautiful companion. who used to come to work with me as well. But my clients started saying something after he died. They started looking at me and saying, you know, something's different. I just don't enjoy coming here as much as I, said, I thought it was me. I thought you were coming to see me. They were coming to see my dog, you know, <laughs> you know, they, they were getting more comfort or as much comfort from the companionship of my four legged son than they, as much as they were getting from their counseling and uh, coaching. But anyhow, that's it. What you're saying is so critically important, you know, whether it's having the comfort of a pet whether it's taking time of any and doing anything. And like I said before, we're all so different. Some of us will find in quiet and silence. I've had people say that I, they started taking a dance class and that just being in that dance class was enough. It rejuvenated them. It replenished them. It filled their cup. Somehow they were allowed, they could go back into the war zone they could go back into the fire. They could go back into that high stress situation and be affected because it, it balanced something out inside of them. And the question of how much is enough is such an important inquiry for each one of us. And I would challenge every one of you who are listening to do you know, what I've done, which is to look at what, what, how are the ways that I talk myself out of self-care? Am I a perfectionist? Do I tell myself I'm taking food out of somebody else's mouth? Do I constantly feed myself the message, it's not enough, you gotta do more to be a good son? Am I working on that deficiency mode? And we, we get it, we walk through, and I have all the self-care saboteurs listed in the book, but we gotta walk through and take inventory and see, am I starting with a disadvantage? Do I need to first get myself to a place where I feel deserving, where I feel worthy, where I know in my heart that this is the best thing for my mom or my dad and for myself and for my own family, for my kids and the life that I have. And it's also something that even after, you know, the nature of this life is that my parents are going to pass at some point, that even after they pass, I will still not be plaguing and beating myself up with, I, I didn't do enough, I could have done more, I should have, could have, would have, that I will be at peace. And we each have to find that element of peace where I can live at ease and, and at peace knowing that I did a great job, I did my best, I brought in the resources to help me, I delegated where I had to, and I also, that serenity prayer that's a part of AA, that I love, 
that I have in the book too, you know, grant me the, the, the strength and the ability and the faith to know and to differentiate those things that I have control over from those things I don't have control over. And to find peace in knowing that we don't get to play God. We can do the best that we can in a given situation, but we don't get to control life and death to, the, to that extent. We can do the best we can and to find peace because that is the, those, that's the nature of life itself. Yep, I completely agree. And for people that are, are regular listeners, they probably remember this story. My dad was in the hospital for 32 days, the, basically the last 32 days of 2016. And he came home for three or four days and he fell. He ended up in a different hospital, one that was closer to their house, which was actually a blessing, a better hospital system than the one he'd been in for a month. My husband said, well, I wonder how many times this is going to happen. We're, we're eating breakfast on a weekend morning. And I just looked up at him like, oh, no, we're done. We're not, we're not going to keep playing this game because I have a lot of friends that are older that I've seen this, you know, revolving door of going to hospitals. So he came home January 12th, 2017 and was on hospice. My oldest dog died on January 28th. My daughter moved out on February 1st. My dad died March 2nd. We put my mom in memory care on March 16th. By the time that had all happened, I, I didn't feel like I should go away, but we had already made plans for like a three-day spring training weekend with some friends. We made that like literally a couple of days before everything blew up with my dad back in the fall. And I thought everything will be fine. My sister is here. There's other family here. You know, it's just mom now, mom and her dog at the time. And so we went to Arizona for three days. And when I came back, I had a little bit more stamina to deal with cleaning out the house and all of that nonsense. They lived in their house just under 47 years to oh. do. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully they weren't hoarders, but just 47 years of stuff. And that was, you know, of course my sister felt like we needed to go through everything, which she wasn't wrong, but we spent, I think two or so hours on one large cabinet had a lot of family photos in it and stuff i thought if the two of us go through this entire house it's going to be another 47 years before it's ready to rent out to pay for mom's memory care rent and she ended up going on a she won a won a trip through work so she was gone like a week in may and then my husband and i were gone almost a week in june and that's kind of when I learned that the world was not going to come to an end. My mother was not going to just completely unravel. I don't even think there was any issues. There wasn't issues for me when my sister was out of the country. There wasn't issues for her when I was in Atlanta that year. So it, I, I kind of learned at that point that you really have to do stuff for yourself. And my dad, this is where the whole family didn't have enough conversations my dad never talked to me about what he thought we should do with my mom if he died first which was a completely logical thing to think about because of his chronic illnesses and he was a couple years older but no we never discussed any of that i don't know why but that was a very bad move he just assumed she'd come live with me and when he was on hospice i didn't even have an extra bedroom because the kids still lived here she was 25 when she moved out, so that was fine. <laughs> it was beyond fine. Like, please go. You're ready to get out of my nest. But I had just turned 50, and I was not at all interested in basically pa pausing my life for the next 20 years because my mom was 75 at the time, mm -hmm. and her mom lived to 91. So I'm like, there's no way. Like, I'm entitled. I've worked hard since I was 16, I'm entitled to have some freedoms finally. Not that, you know, a 20, 20 to 25 year old kid living at home needed very much, but the dogs need more responsibility for me than the kid did. But I wasn't ready for 
you know, being a full-time caregiver. And I also knew it would only be a week and one of us would be gone, her, me, or both because of that parent child dynamic. I get it now when I go visit her, she gets very, if you try to help her, even when she is struggling, yep. she gets very obnoxious. Yep. It's well, you're, part of you're, the, part of the decline is yeah. not only do we get obnoxious now we, with the caregivers I'm I'm searching for a, a way to help the caregivers. She gets verbally abusive with them. She's yeah. always been a little verbally abusive with me. And so it's, I know how they feel, yeah. but they, it's well, not their your, mom. So the story is, is so is, is emphasizes one critically important point, which is that, and when I look at what every chapter in this book is about, it's about communication. It's about getting ahead of the pain curve. It's about here's how to have this conversation before, while you still can, while you can negotiate. And some of us don't, we, we don't know where to begin having a conversation that's so sensitive, that so, that might set our pain. How do I say that in a tone in language that my mother or father would welcome talking openly about this? And how do I, if they aren't willing to talk about it, it's like, I don't want to talk about that. We're never going to talk about that. How do we take care of ourselves? What terms and conditions do we need to establish so that we don't end up in a situation for 20, 10, 20, 30 years where we're in a situation where we can't negotiate with, with them anymore. There's no, they're not there to negotiate. And yet we're having to constantly put up, and the alternative would be to hate ourselves because we'd be feeling guilty. We'd be living in the torture chamber of guilt, I call it. So how do, we, with that. <laughs> how do we get ahead of the pain curve by having the conversations about every single one of these issues? Mom, is, is there, would you be open to talking with me about this situation? Would you please, because I'm, I'm thinking at some point I'm going to need to deal with it. My kids are going to need to do it. And it would be so helpful to me to know and understand what you want, how you want things to go. And could you do that for me? And sometimes invoking that, that least used four-letter word, the one begins with the letter H, help. Mm -hmm. sometimes asking for their help. So it's about you needing their help so that you can be clear about something and know how to honor and respect their wishes in, in the future times, in things that may occur in the future. Sometimes that is worth its weight in gold. And so how do we summon the courage every season of life challenges us to summon newfound courage, newfound strength, newfound clarity and understanding. And each chapter of, of this book, I designed to deal with a new, here's the newfound courage to deal with this conversation, with this challenge, and things like overcoming resentments. How do we not become the resentful version of ourselves? How do we understand that, you know, parents probably did and are doing the best they can so that we're not personalizing it. We're not making it about what they're doing to us. We're the victim. How do we understand that, there, that many of our parents are extremely limited? They didn't grow up in a world in which people were taught to communicate their feelings or their thoughts or their, their desires of the future. So it's very new to them. So we have to be adept at opening communications, at, at helping draw them out and making them feel respected and safe and making it a win for the family so that the family can spend quality time not worrying and stressing about these things, especially because guess what happens to siblings? As parents get older, sibling conflicts and and uh, rivalries and grudges resurface. Suddenly we're dealing with our brothers and sisters 
in a way we haven't had to since we were 10 years old. So how do we prevent those things from happening? How do we take the high road? On each side, that's blonde. So there's like one in each generation. But when we were younger, she always liked to say I was the mailman's baby. So I think we had a male lady, so I'm not sure that was even possible. But Let me ask you a question. What was your favorite part of raising an aging parent? Ugh. I'm not sure I'm done. Yeah. Um, you, you had mentioned earlier when we were talking that, and, and I really, I, it was helpful to me what you mentioned. You said, Ken, reading part of this book was difficult because my, I don't come from generations of communicators. So it really forced me to think about what has happened in my family in the absence of good communication. And it was kind of frustrating at times. And I really, that was helpful to me because, you know, I, I, I would think about that as I was writing. What if, what if somebody is reading this and they've had, they have irreparable differences between themselves and their parents and, and they're trying to find peace within themselves. So it was important for me to talk about two things. Number one, how do we make peace when there have been wounds and irre irreconcilable differences and irreparable conflicts? How do we make peace when a parent is no longer living? And also, how do we, how do we find peace with our chosen families? Because many of us, if you ask us who are the most important people in your life, our families live thousands of miles away. It's the people we have, it's the, the friends that have turned into brothers and sisters or adoptive mothers and fathers. I have a beautiful 96 year old adopted father who lives down the block from me. His, he's, his name is Ken as well. And I call myself Ken Jr. But he's like a father figure. He's a chosen family member. How do we, in this crazy world where we all live differently in different places, and sometimes we find kindred spirits in people that aren't our biological families, how do we cultivate the relationships in our chosen families? Well, one of the things that I've had the benefit, and this is the podcast currently is a labor of love costs me money, does not make any money, sucks up a lot of time. Hopefully that'll change someday. But in the last month, slightly less, like three weeks, I've talked to you and one other person and I've had like a big light bulb go on. I've always said my sister and I are polar opposites. We don't get along. And thankfully in this journey with mom and with dad, we've managed to do pretty darn well. Yes. And I'm not sure how. So I don't question it. We don't talk a lot at this point. She my like I said, my niece is 14, give or take a few days. And my nephew is 10 and a half. And my sister works full time as an insurance broker. So she's busy. And her in-laws live with them. Now they're broke, basically. But they're fair, fairly independent. So they don't need assistance like mom does. And sometimes I get very frustrated because I think like nobody in the extended family, none of my brother, my, none of my aunts or uncles call to see how their sister's doing or my mom or however you want to word that. And sometimes I get really irritated. It's like, seriously, you're just going to like, just throw this out at me. Just, just leave it all up to me. I'm like, you're just I'm like, I guess I appreciate the trust, but I, then I take a step back and I think, well, maybe it's like they don't know what to do. So it's just easier to do nothing. So I try to be very forgiving, which is eh, not always easy. And I've always for the longest time said, you know, I want to live my life so that when mom's gone or whoever, I don't regret that I didn't do something. Do that with, you know, when my grandparents were ill, like basically still, like I said, I still have one which my age is, is amazing. <laughs> and I just, I, the, the gal that I talked to about three weeks ago, she point, she said something. And I realized my sister and I are not polar opposites so much as we just see the world very differently. So I try to take a step back and think now I'm doing this and I'm doing this for all these good reasons, but I know her, she's going to see it different. She's going to see it negative. She's going to see I'm, 
not keeping her in the loop or whatever, pull out whatever negative baloney and, and try to really look at it from her perspective, which is hard because I don't really know what that is, so that I can maybe make adjustments to how, how I approach things. Because sometimes you end up in a spot where you're like, oh, I guess I should have filled them in weeks ago on this situation that didn't seem like a big deal and now it is. And the other thing too is I'm trying to, my husband and I have been married 30 years. So I'm trying to, when he says something, instead of getting upset, is basically saying, now I heard that like X and I'm sure that's not how you said it. So slowly working towards. <laughs> I love it. I love what you're saying because you know what? There's still no more powerful thing that we can experience in this life than the feeling of being understood. That the feeling of being understood is the basis for feeling loved, for being respected, for knowing that somebody has your own what your well-being at heart. They're not just making a lot of noise in their own mind, waiting to talk again and argue their point. And that they they taking the time to care and to really listen. So you doing that, you know, that's the that's the core. And when we do that with our parents, even, you know, even at times, it's, it's crazy because I remember there were times I wasn't sure my mom really was all there or how much of her was there. But when I would listen to her and ask her a simple open-ended question, it's almost like my mom would find her way back to herself instead of getting lost in her thoughts, which were no longer, she couldn't control them as a, a, in a coherent flow state, it would bring her back to something important. She looked me in the eyes and she knew she was loved, even though what we were talking about might've sounded like a lot of blah, blah. So if the love is allowed to prevail because we truly listen to one another, rather than forming a response or a defense or an opinion, we truly listen and it's like, hey, I may see it differently than you. I may see the world differently. And boy, in today's world, a lot of us see things very differently in our families. It's still, I wrote a blog post the other day called, It's Still All in the Family, about my friend Norman Lear's uh, All in the Family. But if we can give each other that listening, then we create bridges in which our love, our care, our concern, our affection, our respect for one another is allowed to prevail more than the sense of disconnection and loss and estrangement. And uh, there's no worse feeling than feeling alone, lonely, disconnected, especially with those people that are our family, people that we have all this history with. So, uh, so that's a good note to, you know, to, at the core of everything is that, is giving the people we love the experience of feeling understood by listening and asking them open-ended questions that allow them to tell whatever it is that's in their heart. Well, with my mom, you can't ask open-ended questions anymore, but I did have an experience yesterday, which you tell me kind of touched on how it actually is better than it seemed in the moment. It, you guys probably experienced the same thing. We had what mid to low 80 degrees and now we have like 70 yep. <laughs> oh, in a week. It just drops 10, 15 degrees. I had lunch with mom yesterday for a couple reasons. One, the director for the memory residence said that mom had a, a, a meal where she forgot to use how to, how to use her fork. And so I thought, well, I've been saying I need to go and actually sit and have a full meal with her and kind of observe. And it's not so much she forgot how to use her fork, or at least yesterday, it was the, the dessert item was in a bowl, a little small dish. It was, I popped mine on the plate because it was easier to slice and eat that way. But she couldn't navigate a different solution. So she was using her fork and her fingers and it's like with people with Alzheimer's, that's very common. So, you know, I don't get hung up on manners because that would just 
make me crazy and I don't need any more of that. But while we were having lunch, I realized, oh, shoot, I forgot to bring all of her winter clothes. We went through a situation where she was wearing the same thing over every day. Like mm -hmm. I hadn't seen her in something different in like two months. So I had, I took all of the, the fall winter clothing out of her closet and I, I limited the, what was in her closet very, you know, so it was just much simpler because when your brain is broken and you look in a closet, it's just full, even a small closet, it's confusing. Jennifer, you are such a good daughter. I just have to stop you. <laughs> Thank you. You, <laughs> you know, I think sometimes, I, I don't know how, if we allow ourselves to let it in, but listening to you talk about all the, the considerations, all the ways that you have taken care of your mom, that you anticipate helping her meet those needs, the way you accept her, the way you have struggled with the anguish of losing her bit by bit, and yet you still show up in a loving way. I think that's an example for all of us that just speaks for itself. So I want to commend you and thank you for being that example to all of us about what it, what it looks like well, to be thank human. You. We're human. You're not a superhuman. You, you're vulnerable. You're honest about how it hurts, about um, how frustrating it is, about how hard it is sometimes to take care of ourselves. You're being honest about all those things because we're human. But the bottom line is that you've shown up in a way that I, I would hope and pray that when your mom's time is, is done, that you would have a, a feeling of peace in your heart knowing that you were a daughter who showed up to the best of her abilities and uh, that, you can, that you can feel good about that and be at peace with that for the rest of your life. Well, that's my goal. Because if I live as long as my paternal grandmother, I don't want to live, you know, 30 or 40 years feeling guilty. As I was putting her winter clothes away, she got angry because she needed assistance in the bathroom. And she just, it just rubbed every last piece of fur backwards on her. She was just angry and rah, 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 rah. she was a little verbally abusive. And I just, as much, it doesn't, it doesn't roll off your back. It still stings, but I didn't say anything snarky back to her because that's really asking for trouble. Yeah, because she, that's, how could she feel in her condition with her frustration? How could she feel? How could she not feel snarky? Mm -hmm. How could she not feel so exasperated, so frustrated, so disconnected? You know, so well, she left her. Good. She left her room. I was not finished doing what I needed to do, and I knew she couldn't finish it. So I'm just putting clothes on hangers and hanging them in the closet. She came back, you know, five or so minutes later, and she didn't remember I was there, and I. I got this sense when she walked back in the room that she was calmer. And I think seeing somebody familiar, now she thinks I'm her best friend. So that's interesting. I think seeing somebody familiar helped her be a little more calm. Cause I noticed I'm like, she, her energy is totally different. And I didn't change mine. I just kept doing what I needed to do. And I thought, you know, it was kind of like the open-ended question. It was just like, I was just accepting how she needed to be. And when she was done being snarky and grumpy and she came back, it was, everything was better. Yep. Yeah. What are the question that, and maybe it's a good note to end on, but the question that we all ask ourselves is what am I expected to be here? How am I expected to be? How can I be here? What am I being asked? to give? How can I value and honor my own life, my own family, my own, all the other things that constitute my life and yet show up in a way that's honorable, that really serves, that supports and helps. And, and, uh, and even if there's a momentary glance in which my mother looks over and sees a friend helping her, I've given her that moment of comfort, that moment of ease, and that's worth the price of admission itself. Even if 
my mom is not the mom and not the person. She's no longer the person that I knew as my mother. And how can I allow that as, as unsettling as that is, as, as, as much as I might be grieving the loss of the mother I knew, how can I somehow allow that to be the way life is and the way life turns out sometimes and find peace, some measure of peace and go on and bring that into the rest of my own life in an honorable way. And I think that's, that's the question we all face. And I hope that in some small way, I've been helpful. I, I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation that you've convened uh, around the world in, in your podcast. And I'm honored to have been able to contribute to it in some small way today. And, and I hope that those people that end up reading Raising Age and Aging Parent uh, find great value and they find that peace, but they also find some of the tools that you talked about, some of the helpful tints to how to have these conversations, how to deal with all these situations as they arise. And I hope to hear from your people in your audience about things that, that were very helpful to them. That would be great. If you hear from them, I'd like, I'd like to hear it too. You got it. You got it. And well, let's thank you, you and I please stay in touch. Oh, definitely. And once again, I really recommend this book, even, even if you're in a position like me where nobody in the family is good at communicating, mom can't communicate normally, for lack of a better term. That was finger quotes for those people who aren't watching the YouTube channel. Um, it, if you get just a little bit of insight for yourself to make your own life a little better, it's worth the price. So thank you so much, Ken. Thank you again, Jennifer. So good to be with you. You too. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye now.